I've told this to people before when I've prayed for them. They've asked me for another word, and I gave this one young lady this. I said, the Lord said to do all the other words he gave you. <laughs> That's your word. You know, and she started laughing. She goes, you know, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Let me get to this because this freaks everybody out. Why the word there is hate? It's an English issue. Jesus is not teaching us to hate our closest relatives, okay? So don't use that as a license. Well, Jesus told me to hate you. You know, you can't go and do that. That's, that's not what he's talking about. Not even, even to your mother-in-law, you can't do that, all right? You love them, and, and, and the Bible says in Proverbs, we were reading it last week, I think it says, a man of understanding will receive a rebuke, right? Because you want to know what's wrong. And if, you're, if you just think you're burying your head in the sand and say, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, you got a problem. And so if you can't see it, ask God first before you go start talking to people. You know, but even then, you know, how many of us are willing to go to our spouse and say, is there really anything I need to work on? <laughs> so anything we give preference to over Jesus can be considered an idol. And we can make our family members idols. All right, so we're doing, uh, we're teaching on uh, the ministry of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5. This came from a prophetic dream. The Lord told me to teach on Wednesday nights on this. And as I, as I summarized last week a little bit, uh, the ministry of reconciliation, in a nutshell, is getting us back to the place we were before the fall. And that we would understand our heirship and our inheritance that we have in Christ, that God never wants us to live below an abundant life. He never wants us to live below having everything that's been destined for us to have. Everything that's been written in your book, Psalms 139, 16, is part of the ministry of reconciliation. And when you're fully reconciled to Christ, you will have everything that's written about you. And I, I want to say this. You should have a track record of prophecies over your life that you're at a high percentage of them coming to pass. I don't know what that number is, but it should be very high. And if it's not, we got to find out what is it that's holding you back from entering into all that's been said about you, written about you, and is there anything in your heart that's kept you from walking in all that? It should get to a place where you have so many prophecies you don't need any more. I understand you should be walking in some of that where you go, I don't have enough time to finish what I've started here. But God will keep adding to them, but I want you to understand this. Have a heart to walk in everything that Christ said for you. I, I did, I, I've, I've told this to people before when I've prayed for them. They've asked me for another word, and I gave this one young lady this. I said, the Lord said to do all the other words he gave you. <laughs> That's your word. You know, and she started laughing. She goes, you know, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and I was like... You know, because sometimes just accumulating words doesn't change your life. you got to do them, right? And so the ministry of reconciliation gives you the, the skill set it takes to fulfill and walk in everything that's written about you. And, and, and until we get there, we're not going to feel the joy and the fulfillment of what we were born to do. Now, tonight I'm going to deal with an with a idol, a, a, a sacred cow, because we're, we started talking about the cross and what the cross does for us. And we're going to get into something, so if I could, lock the doors and make sure everybody stays, because about halfway through, you're going, why is he doing this to me? And, uh, but I think it's very important that we understand that the spirit of this world will obscure to you all the things that Christ has given to you. You understand that? If you have a love of the things of this world, it'll obscure what Christ has for you. And you will substitute the things of this world and the spirit of this world for what Christ has. And that's such a dangerous thing to do because, okay, I got money, I got joy, I got peace, whatever that the world offers, and that is a counterfeit to the greater joy, prosperity, and blessing God has for you. So that's why in 1 Corinthians 2.13, it says, you have, you have received not the spirit which is of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So you will not know what's been given to you freely by God if you have the spirit of the world in any way. You'll have a measure of understanding, but you'll not have the fullness of the understanding. So when he goes on to say uh, uh, in, in uh, John 18, 36, he says, My kingdom, Jesus did, he said this to Pontius Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. But my kingdom is not from here. 
And we got to remind ourselves, we, we got to bear in mind the kingdom of God is not of this world. So when we are tapping into this world system or the spirit of this age to fill a void in our heart, then what happens is we, we, we are discounting and we will not see what God has freely given us. The very thing inside of us that we are filling our holes with is the very thing he wants to fill them. He wants to fill those areas in our heart, right? We have to go after that. Entertainment's a big one. Okay, that's one idol. We'll just, and I like entertainment. You know, I'm, I like movies. I'm not as, like John. I mean, but uh, <laughs> John loves movies. I mean, and he's always getting something spiritual out of them. And, um, right, what? No, he does. He's really good at it. I mean, I don't, I don't know how he does it. I'm just like, that's horrible. But anyway, um, entertainment is, 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 can be, the spirit of entertainment is a false reality of the throne. You know when you go into movie theaters, one of the closest things to the throne is, you know, it's focused. You have one thing you focus on. You don't focus on anything else around you. You got sound everywhere around you. You have this atmosphere where you're lost. You disappear, and what's going on the screen becomes the focus. That's what the throne is. You lose sight of everything else in your life, the sound of heavens all around you, and the focus is the throne. Okay? So what we can do is just a picture of it, but I, I understand we can live in that place. Let's live in the place where we lose sight of everything and our focus is upon the throne. Amen? All right, that was free. All right. Um, uh, secondly, you're free of Satan's manipulations and deceptions when you go after this. And I want to say that, especially through what the world's offering right now, which is false. Um, and, and, and that is what we want, the spiritual truth. So I want to be released and I want you to be released from the dominion of this world and the spirit of this world so you will have the power to refuse anything the world puts under you, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they said, no, we will not bow. We will do, do we have the strength to do that? Do we have a strength if we have a choice to go to prison or die or, to, or accept Christ? Do we have that? I don't know if we do sometimes until we get in that situation. But if you have the spirit of the world, I guarantee you're going to have a hard time doing that. But if you have the, 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 the spirit of reconciliation where your joy is full in him, it doesn't matter. You will go to that place without a doubt. Okay, so we're going to push you. Not, you're not going to die tonight, maybe next week, but we're not going to die tonight. Or we, want to, we want to go there. It's a, it's a lot of pressure on us. Okay, so let's, go about, let's talk about the application of the cross of, of Christ in our life. Now, this is one of the litmus tests in our life. If you have allowed the work of the cross in your life, the major thing you will see in your life is change, <laughs> transformation. And if you're not seeing change, if you're seeing everything status quo, that tells me you're not applying the power of the cross to your life. Any area of your life that's stagnant, it has to do because you've not applied the cross to that area of your life. So we're going to apply it. We're going to go after it. No change. There's no application of the cross. Okay, let's turn to Matthew 10, verse 34 through 39. Let's go through this. And uh, let's see where you are. Now, we're going to deal, like I said, with some sacred cows tonight. And then uh, we'll see if you come back next week. Um, he says this in verse uh, 34, 10, 34, Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. You ever thought about that? Peace on earth, goodwill to men, right? <laughs> no, he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Okay, and we're not talking about physical war. I think it's very important for us to grasp Jesus is not just offering the world peace the way the world wants peace. Okay? In fact, it's very much the opposite. There's no doubt about that. He brought a sword, and what does a sword do? Divides. Isn't that lovely? And let me tell you something. If you're going to bear a cross and you're going to die the cross, you're going to have division. With the things that are not of Christ in your life and the people in your life that are not of Christ, you will have division. Isn't that lovely? And uh, you didn't know that when you said, Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you as my Savior. Amen. 
you didn't know he was coming with the sword. I think we should tell people that when they get born again. <laughs> Maybe they won't sign up, but I think they should, right? It separates, and it goes on. He says here, next verse, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, that's obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> And a man's foes will be those of his own. Isn't that lovely? Your own household. If you've got a great family, God bless you. <laughs> okay, so the impact of the gospel will bring division in your family. It will. You're going to find out who has the spirit of the world in your family and who has the spirit of Christ in your family. So like when our kids were boys, you know, we had family members that lived lifestyles that we didn't agree with, and we didn't take them to their houses for certain holidays and different things. And so what they say, well, y'all don't love blood. You're, we're blood. You're supposed to come here. I said, look, I'm not submitting my children to that environment. You understand? And, I, and, I, and it was really hard because we got beat up pretty good about that. My dad, why don't you bring it around more often? I said, Dad, because you got that stuff in your house. And I said, I'm not letting my boys be around that stuff. And it wasn't until my dad got that stuff dealt with that I started bringing my kids around. Okay, so it, it brings division. Isn't that lovely? Okay, keep reading. It says, he who loves father or mother more, everybody say more. more. That's your key word, right? Then me is not worthy of me. That's power. You see how serious that is? So we're going to deal with the idolatry of ancestral worship. Now, they have that in Africa. They literally worship ancestors. Well, we Christians don't do that. Mm. <laughs> you know, when you, I've had to, as a pastor, I've counseled people about family members, and all of a sudden their family members have no sin. They're perfect in the counseling session. My daddy would never do that. Well, he did. You know, he's not like that. Yes, he did. I saw it in my own eyes. And they, they have this blindness about their family, okay? He's not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. There's three times right there. Is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So until you lose your life in Christ, you actually don't find your life. How many people are living their lives and have not lost it yet? Okay, uh, let me, you don't have to turn there. Let me read these real fast. These are parallel scriptures. Matthew 16, 24, 25. Then Jesus said to the disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Now, we say this all the time, but I don't think we ever slow down to listen to it. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's one other passage. Another parallel is John 12, 24 through 26. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or much fruit, is a better way of putting it. He who loves his life will lose it, and who hates his life in this world, we'll keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant may be. If anyone serves me, with him my Father will, will, will honor. Okay, so these are parallel. So these passages are similar. They're a little bit different wording. But I think Jesus lays it very simply and very clearly, the response that God requires to make the message or to make sure that we understand the message of the cross. I think he, un, uh, ca he states categorically what it means to be a disciple. And I, and I want to talk about that. So let's turn to Luke 14, verse 26 through 30. If, if I was to ask you all a question, what is the disciple, what would be the first things that pop in your mind? What would you say, John? A learner. That's good. Discipline. Okay. We have, we have a lot of... Let's really see what a disciple is or what the cost of being a disciple is. Luke, Luke 14, verse 26. All right, he says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate, everybody say hate. hate. 
his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Hmm. Jesus doesn't say it'll be difficult for him. <laughs> he says he can't be my disciple. Okay, we're going to define hate here in just a minute. It'll help you out a little bit. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Somehow, some people's Bibles have lost this verse. It's like it fell out and they don't know where it went. Why? That's not in my Bible. It is in your Bible. Why don't people quote it? Because it's hard. It's a very hard verse. I'm not going to lie. Whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Okay. So all you want is all, Lord? That's all you want? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. He said that's pretty good. That's pretty good analysis. So let's break it down. The first one we're required to do is to deny ourselves. I'm required to deny myself. What does that mean to deny myself? What do y'all think of when I say that? It's all God. Yeah. Yeah, flesh. Yeah, that's right. It basically means I have to say no <laughs> to my flesh. Okay. Now, that's not victory yet. I get that. I don't want to just be a denier of my flesh and not have victory over my flesh because I want to say no with joy. I want to say no because God's got something better for me than what you're offering me. You know, uh, this momentary sin is pleasurable for a season. I don't want that. So to whom am I to say no to? Who do we say no to? Me. <laughs> I got to say no to me. I don't have to say no to somebody else. Somebody said, hey, let's go get drunk. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have to say no to them, but I got to say no to me because me says let's go get drunk. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So denying self means I have to stop myself. Okay? So, hang in there. Don't, don't leave me yet. To whom I'm supposed to. So, if I'm crucified with Christ, which we quote all the time in Galatians 2.20, that means I have to give up all my rights. I no longer exist, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, we're not there yet, are we? We're getting there, right? We should be there. And if you think you're there, we have a, a deliverance for pride. And we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later because we're all struggling with some area of our life we don't want to give up. You know, I love sarcasm. And, and there are times that, that I have used it out of anger. That's hard, shocking, I know. But, uh, and there are times that I need to be delivered of that, right? Sarcasm can be okay because me and John have found it all over Scripture. We, we know it's in there. It's just a matter of what's my motive behind my sarcasm. See, like my, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is when Elijah asked the Baal prophets, is your God on the pot? And that's one of my favorite scriptures because <laughs> I wish I could have been there to say that, you know? But he didn't say that out of arrogance. It was a challenge because he knew who his God was, okay? So Jesus said, whosoever will save his life will lose it. Now, the word for life there, the, the Greek word there is psych, what we call psyche. You ever heard that term? Psyche, which means your soul. So it's very commonly translated life, but it means the soul. So the root meaning is soul. So here's a better way of putting it. Now, whosoever will lose his soul will find it. So we got to lose our soul. What, is it, what does it mean to lose our soul? Obviously, it doesn't mean, you know, I go into be lost to be in eternity. I don't mean that, but it's the opposite of that. Question is, can we be a disciple? Or, or better way to put it, is being a disciple and being saved different? <laughs> I don't think you can find anywhere in the New Testament that it speaks about people being saved who are not becoming disciples. So somebody who says they're born again and is not becoming a disciple, I have to question their salvation. Okay, you have to. If you're born again, you start like a new baby. What does a baby have to be? He has to be trained. He's got to be equipped. He's got to learn how to walk. He's got to learn how to eat. He's got to learn all these different things. And there are many that just like to pray the prayer, right? 
I, when I was a youth pastor, there was this, this, this uh, drama all around town, Hell's Flames. What was it called? Hell's, Heaven's Gates, Hell Flames, you know? And it was great for my youth group. I went from like 30 to 100. I mean, overnight, I had all these kids born again, fired up, you know? And I thought, wow, man, that's great. Only to find out they, were, they just got the hell scared out of them. You know, that was really all that happened. And they didn't want to change. They still loved the spirit of the world. But they got scared during the drama. And it wasn't three months. They were all gone. And they're right back in the world, right? And so that wasn't a disciple. Somebody prayed a prayer. didn't make them a disciple. I think it was John Wesley said, he used to have 5 o'clock prayer every morning. He said, if you will come every day at 5 for a year, I might consider you a disciple. <laughs> That's a little bit stringent. A little bit probably a religious spirit at some level. But... His point was, if you're going to be a believer, you've got to show fruit that you're going to be a believer. Okay? So Jesus says, you've got to lose your psyche. You've got to lose it. The will, the intellect, and the emotion. The will, you know, we, we call that the psyche or the soul. I'm not saying that's doctrine. It just kind of gives you a picture of mind, will, and emotion is what it's all about. Now, what does it mean to lose your soul? What does that mean? Because that's what he tells us to do. Here's what it means, I think. It means that you no longer are motivated and controlled by those three things, your mind, will, and emotions. They don't control you. That's what it means. They're, they're gone. That's your lower nature. That's your old man. He's gone now. And now you're living to Christ. You're beginning to have your, your mind is on Christ. Your will is on Christ. Everything you're doing, your emotions are tied to Christ. That's what it means to have a, a reconciled life that I no longer am controlled by those arenas. But now I'm controlled by His Spirit in all that I do. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8, if I walk in the flesh, I'll not give in to the, the... I mean, when I walk in the Spirit, I'll not give in to the lust of the flesh. So when we fall to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, it's because we're not walking in the Spirit and we've not been reconciled in that area and that's an area that we're still alive in and we've not died to it. Our soul is still functioning. Now, we're made up of spirit, soul, and body. We teach us about alignment. And when your sp spirit is not leading, your soul is, what happens? The Bible says it's vain imaginations that have exalted themselves above the knowledge of God. Right? Because you've got knowledge of God is in the spirit of God. Soul doesn't have that. And what you do is you say, spirit, move over. I'm stepping up. And now what happens? Your body is functioning under the, uh, under the flow of your soul, your psyche. And the spirits are going, hey, what about me? And every once in a while, yeah, yeah, come on, you can come in on this one because I like this part or I don't like this part. So we kind of slide the spirit in and out of our life according to what we don't want to give up. Okay, here we go. Um, does this make sense to y'all? I'm, I'm trying to make it really simple. Um, <clears throat> And, and, and I want to lay down my soul. And, and, and what I want to do is I want to lay down my soul so much now that my soulish desires, my psyche, doesn't dictate, dictate what I do every day. How many of y'all have certain food addictions you just can't get rid of? You know? What, does anybody have a chocolate issue? All right, yeah, whatever your issue is, you know, we can have that. And, you know, and let me tell you, just saying I'm not going to eat that, it doesn't make it go away, you know? <laughs> It's like Satan calls M&Ms and tells them to call you. Whatever, you know, you, you have this thing. And so there, that's, that's a natural picture here. But you can have anything, like you just like to think bad stuff or you like to replay things in your mind all the time. Whatever, you can have, I'm just making stuff up. You know, I hope I probably hit somebody right between the eyes here. All right. A soulish man is the man who is dominated by what I want, what I think, and what I feel. See, and as Americans, we have the pride issue that, that says that's good. And we've said it before. I, I struggle with that because everybody has a prophetic destiny. And we'll see this. You'll go, we'll see teachers going to kids and say, how many of y'all want to be president of the United States? You know, and half of them raise And that's just not going to happen. Why are you giving hope to somebody that that's not their destiny? And see, their will will say, oh, I'll just fight and I'll become president. I think we got one that did that right now. But uh, it's, it's one of these things where what if that's not written for you? 
then what happened is you didn't die to your soul, and now you've become something that God never destined you to be. Because for whatever reason, you had the spirit of the world on you that I'm going to be successful in the eyes of the world, and you created a destiny for yourself. You wrote your own script, and now you're walking in, and you wonder why you have no joy. Because joy only comes from walking in what you want. I remember when Mark went to, y'all went to Mississippi. He told me how bad it was there. Remember that? He thought all the money was in Mississippi, he told me. And he said he couldn't wait to get back to Shreveport because it was not the will of God, was it? <laughs> And you can make all the money you want somewhere. I had a guy who went to a school, a ministry school. We knew it wasn't the Lord. We, we, and the Lord said, don't say nothing to him. He'll learn. And the Lord said he'll cost him two years of his destiny. And, and I had guest ministers come in. They saw him. And they said, hey, that boy right there, he's about to make a bad decision. I said, yeah, I know. He said, the Lord told me not to say nothing. I said, me either. So he went to school. He's there six months. He calls me, Pastor, I made a mistake. <laughs> I said, I know you did. He said, can I come home? And you know what? He came home, and it, it, he didn't want to say this. He spun out, and he's never recovered. And this is so important that we die to our soul, because what he wanted, he had this idolatry of ministry, so he thought this school was going to give him what he wanted, so he made a choice to go to this school so he could get the, the, uh, the quote, anointing or the, the, the status so he could do that thing, and so that very thing pulled him down. And I don't want that for anybody. So you understand that? You stay in your lane. Look at your neighbor and say, stay in your lane, all right? <laughs> all right. Um, okay. So if, if you are walking, if your soul is dominated by I want, I will, I feel, then what's going to happen is you cannot receive the things of the Spirit. You cannot because you are blocking the things of the Spirit. If God's trying to speak to you, and you say, well, I just don't feel like doing that. And God said, well, you need to go on Wednesday nights. Well, I don't feel like it. I'm talking about, hey, y'all on the cameras, <laughs> anybody, whatever. You know, I'm just making that up. <laughs> but what if you have something for an impartation to be there? Now, my wife is the best Holy Spirit for me on that because I don't like to go anywhere most of the time. I, I could be a hermit. I really could. And she goes, well, I think we're supposed to go. Hmm. You know, and I, I, I have to die to soul and say God does speak through the Holy Spirit through my wife. Usually, almost always when I'm not listening, she's the Holy Spirit, right? Because she knows what's right at, at that time. Not, not, not 100%, but, you know, no, she is most of the time. She's, she's a redemptive prophet, so I don't have much choice. But anyway, so I, there has to be a death. There has to be a death. That's what it means to lay it down. I have to lay it down. The soulish man cannot receive unless you lay it down because it's a block. It's a hindrance. It's an obstacle to the Spirit of God. Can you imagine how frustrated the Holy Spirit is with you when he wants to set you free and you want to hold on to your junk? And he has a plan for you to be totally free, and you're like, well, I like my junk better. I mean, that has to grieve the Holy Spirit in such a way that Christ died so that Spirit could come and give you the fullness of life. And you have not died in your soul to allow that to happen. And so what, what takes its place, it, it, what needs to take its place is I want to do God's will, I want to think about God's Word, and I want to feel God's standard. That's what I have to do. And realize that that is, that is what we're called to do. When we were in Japan... One of the biggest battles that they have there is fear of man. It's a shame culture, which means if you don't perform at such a level, society will shame you. So what they have is this. It's, there's some of it in America, too. Don't get me wrong. But what it has is they're unwilling to take risk because they're so afraid they'll fail. So therefore, in ministry, they don't reach out to people because of that fear. And so one of the pastors asked me to teach on the fear of God because they feared man more than God. So we had to, to lay that foundation for them. And so we were giving them, John's up there giving the story, you know, he's a storyteller. And he's telling stories of how to go out on the street and minister and prophesy. And the pastor looks at me and goes, my people won't do any of that. They're scared. They're scared that person will reject them. See, that's where their soul hasn't died. They haven't laid down their life. And here's the thing. They're withholding their life for the kingdom. And you have a nation that's 99% lost. 
There's only 1% Christians in Japan. And there you have these Christians who've not died to self, not died to the soul, and so they're withholding the gospel. Remember when Fabian was here from Iraq? He talked about when they're sharing the gospel to Muslims, and they, Muslims will say to them, why didn't you tell me earlier? Yeah. And, well, we thought you might cut our head off. You know, I understand that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big issue. You need to be led of the Spirit. But, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes our fear is going to keep us from doing what God's asked us to do in that place, all right? Does it make sense to you? All right. So, really, uh, our civilization, especially in America, we, we run by feelings. Most everybody, that's what the lower nature, lower nature is like an animal. And you've heard me teach that before. And it's kind of gross, but it is. It's a lower nature. An animal does not have a conscience. It does what it wants to do. If you've ever had a weird dog that does weird things, you know what I'm talking about. Like, what's wrong with this thing, man? What did he get that? He's lower nature, right? If his, if his soul, whatever, I don't know if dog has a soul. Don't say that dog, dog lovers. But anyway, he doesn't care. He's not loyal to one female. If there's 15 females in heat, he's going after all 15 of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know it's kind of gross. But here's the thing. That's what a soul that hasn't died yet is it will go after anything without any conscience. That was, it's probably worse than the booty thing, but you all understand what I'm saying, all right? Um, <laughs> all right. Now, <laughs> here we go. Laying down feelings, listen to me, laying down feelings involves our closest personal relationships. And this is where it gets hard, right? Because this is where we get codependency. We have all these other issues where I can't function without this person in my life. And, you know, I love my wife. They say, or I love my husband more than anything in the world. It's really not biblical. We've got to love Jesus more than anything else. doesn't mean we don't love our spouses that much. But what happens if I love my wife or she loves me more than she loves Jesus? Guess what happens? The soul has exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And the Bible says we got to pull that down. Every vain imagination that exalts itself to the knowledge of God, right? So this is where it gets really serious. Now let's look again at Matthew 10. I was reading it earlier for a moment. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those in his own house. He who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and who loves his son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then he goes on about taking up your cross, and the implication is taking up the cross. That's the implication there. Now, Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, his own life, or we can say his own psyche, his own soul. He cannot be my disciple. And we're talking about a reconciled life. This is where we have to be. Now, we need to understand when, let me get to this because this freaks everybody out, why the word there is hate. It's an English issue. Jesus is not teaching us to hate our closest relatives, okay? So don't use that as a license. When Jesus told me to hate you. You know, you can't go and do that. That's, that's not what he's talking about. Not even, even to your mother-in-law, you can't do that, all right? What he's saying here is, is that you can't have anything that competes with your total loyalty to me. And if you have a relationship that's competing with your loyalty to Christ, you've not died to your soul. And it's hard, right? We love people. We want to be loved. I mean, I tell this story all the time of Paul Cain. He was a prophet, amazing prophet uh, of our time. He died a few years ago. And uh, in the 1940s and 50s, he was part of the healing movement, and he had one of the most profound gifts I'd ever seen in my life. And the Lord said, um, you're in a rat race, and if you don't get out, you're going to become a rat. And he said, I want you to go to the desert, and I want you to stay there for 20 years because that's how long it's going to take God to clean up the mess of that ministry because the ministry got convoluted. The whole healing ministry got all jacked up, and it needed to be cleaned. And so he went to Arizona, 
and he went out there, and this is what happened to him. Jesus appeared to him physically every day, and he had communion with Jesus. So Jesus was, for him, the relationship that he thought man would be for him. Because, see, he surrendered and he gave up human companionship for relationship, and Jesus loved him so much he showed up to him every day. After he said, this is his testimony. We heard this testimony from him. I'm, it's not something I read because I was in Fort Worth, Texas. I remember when he was telling it. And he said, after about 15 or so years, he said, I really miss human companionship. And he said to the Lord, he said, I love this communion, Lord, but I need human companionship. And the Lord said to him, I'm sufficient. I'm enough for you. And he said, He'd wait a week or a month or so, and he'd had that conversation with Jesus over and over again. And finally, after about 20 years, near the 20-year end, he said, Lord, I have to have human relationship. And the Lord disappeared and stopped having that communion with him. And he came back, and he, he still functioned in ministry, but he eventually fell into homosexuality and uh, really never recovered from that till he died. And that's one of those things when you didn't die to your soul. In other words, you desired something above what God had for you. Then you're not a disciple. You're not worthy of him ultimately because you're not allowing that. Now, I'm not here saying tonight when you leave, you better be dead. I'm here to say there has to be a working process in your life. And, and, and it's said this way, there must be a yes in your spirit. Yes, Lord, I'm moving forward. Yes, I want you to look at my life. I want you to show me in here. Look, you have to have revelation before you can have consecration. If you don't know areas of your life that you're not dead to, ask. And if you don't hear anything, ask somebody around you. <laughs> look at somebody, you somebody really close. Have you seen anything in my life that needs to die? <laughs> now get a notepad out and because uh, they're going to talk to you for a while. I don't, I don't think that, look, if they love you, if you love them, and, and the Bible says in Proverbs, we were reading it last week, I think it says, uh, a man of understanding will receive a rebuke, right? Because you want to know what's wrong. And if, you're, if you just think you're burying your head in the sand and say, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, you got a problem. And so if you can't see it, ask God first before you go start talking to people. You know, but even then, you know, how many of us are willing to go to our spouse and say, is there really anything you need to work on? <laughs> you know, if they love you, they're going to be nice, you know, and not, you know, hammer you. But, but at least, you know, you have a little, you'll have a little edge in the mornings. You know, can we talk about that? You know, I, I had one guy that he was the sweetest guy until his allergies acted up. And then he was a bear. I mean, you didn't want to be around him. And he'd always, my, si my sinuses, my sinuses, my sinuses. And finally, Jenny said to him one time, the sinuses are revealing your stronghold. You need to deal with it. <laughs> you know, Jenny, our friend. Yeah, if you, that's the first person you go to. She'll tell you. <laughs> she will. She'll tell you. All right. <laughs> okay. So he's telling us here, he doesn't want to hate is to hate anything that competes with loyalty. You have to hate that. If it's your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, whatever, it claims to be in the way of your commitment to Christ. And that's what he wants us to deal with. In that respect, you have to hate it. You hate the fact that you give loyalty to something else other than him. It's not that I hate my family or hate them. I hate that thing inside of me that says I want them more than I want him. And I have to have their acceptance. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that, that's something we're having to deal with in Japan, is they want that more than they want the acceptance of Christ. And we're, we, we don't know exactly how to deal with it yet, but we know God's brought us there to help them in that way. Jesus is saying, I have no rival. We sing that song, right? I have no rival. If I was to measure us all, measure myself, is that true? Hmm. Think about that. Can you imagine when you're born again, you bring all your lovers with you? You know, you do. You bring all the things that you love in this world and the things you come, and you come to Jesus. I'm all yours, Jesus. And, and then you say, this is my, this is my harem. You know, they, they, they're all part of my life, you know. 
And uh, they're not bad. I've seen other people do those things, you know. And Jesus said, well, I want to get rid of the harem. I want to be the bridegroom. So you're going to have to let some of these folks go. <laughs> and sometimes you have to let folks go. You understand? So anything we give preference to over Jesus can be considered an idol. And we can make our family members idols. So Jesus said, I will accept no idols. I want your complete, total loyalty. My claims take precedent over anything that your psyche wants. You understand? I told you this is going to be rough. If you hated your father and mother without hating your own psyche, you'd be out of line with the Word of God. Well, my parents abused me, and I hate them. Well, guess what? You love your psyche more than you love the Lord because the Bible says to honor your mother and father, to love those who abuse you, love those who hate you. So I hadn't died enough to love even those who abused me. And I'm not saying you agree with their behavior. Never. Never. And I don't say you don't put boundaries because you do. But the fact is you got to find a place in Jesus that he can give you a place to love them, that he can do that, right? Well, usually I like to teach these messages when I'm in another country and get on a plane and leave. But I'm, I'm, I'm still here, right? <laughs> That's one of my famous lines. I'm leaving tomorrow, so I'm, I'm leaving. One of the pastors there in Japan said to us after we asked him what he thought of the ministry that morning, he said, y'all guys are really direct. <laughs> he said, Japanese teaching goes around the issue. Y'all went right after it. <laughs> and I was like, and we, we were just being us, weren't we, John? We were just being us. But they're not used to somebody directly speaking to it. And I think tonight we need to be direct. So likewise, it says, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, look, again, Discipleship is a process. You know, getting saved is an invitation to sanctification. It's an invitation to allow the Lord to sanctify your life. And look, you can't do this by yourself. Just saying no doesn't cut it. Holy Spirit, I see that I have this idol in my life. Please help me in this area. Show me, Lord, what I can do. What's the path out of this? Lord, remove this thing. David said, if there's any wicked way in me, Lord, you know, David was covering every sin possible. If there's any unknown sin, Lord, I repent of that. You know, I think that's, he was trained by Natasha. You know, you just rep, you repent of anything and everything. If I've been, that girl makes me repent of everything around her. You need to repent of this. You need to repent of that. Well, it's probably true, but I like, I can repent, but I need revelation of what I'm repenting of. And, and there are times when I, when I repent, it hits, and there's times I'm like, I'm just going through the mechanism. And a lot of people do that. They just repent in mechanism, and they don't really have a psyche change. Their soul's not changed. We need transformation. And we've been prepared, you know, we've been prepared to let go of everything if we're going to follow Christ. doesn't matter, possessions, whatever. That's the condition of being a disciple. It's very simple. <laughs> as far as the guidelines, it's, it's very simple. So Jesus didn't introduce a lot of complication when he did this. This isn't very complicated. Difficult, yes. Um, and and it's, it's, it's commitment it requires. And he said, if you don't do that, you'll start, uh, you, you'll never be able to finish the house that I wanted to start. So, because when we become him and him, we start building the house unto the Lord, right? So you go, you'll have to go to war, but you won't have the sufficiency to win if you don't deny yourself. So I'm trying to fight this addiction. I'm trying to fight this battle, this lust issue, whatever I'm fighting. But if I haven't denied myself and I haven't died to the flesh, I don't have a weapon. I'm just swinging at the air. But when I die and I say, God, I deny myself, I want you to, what happens? He puts his sword in our hand. And it's a two-edged sword, which is it, it rightly cuts and divides to asunder, right? It, it shows you the desires or the intentions of the heart. That's one of the worst things you can ever say. Hear my heart. And I'm hearing it. The question is, the Bible says that nobody knows their own heart. Jeremiah 17, it's utterly wicked and deceitful above all things. So don't get caught in that. I'm just, this is my heart was really to help them. Is that true? 
You don't know if that's true. You need the Holy Spirit to tell you what your motion was, what your motivation was. Well, as, and if, if, you're, if you're really honest with God, he'll tell you. <laughs> all right, so we need all the weapons we got. So he says, sit down, count the cost. That's what we need to do. And what does it cost to be a disciple? Is this fair to us that, that he's asking us to do this? But I want you to understand this. Christ is not given a false picture here. He's given a true picture here. And he says, look, you can have everything if you'll just do this. And we think we'll lose everything if we give up this. All right? That's why he says if you lose your life, you gain it. So if you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, I want, just close your eyes for a second. <laughs> I don't want you to look at me. I tried to use humor while I beat the snot out of you tonight. If you're sitting here and almost every one of you is thinking something, I can see it on your faces. <laughs> What does it mean I have to give up? You know, what does it mean I have to have to do? And you fill in the blank. What I have to, the answer is yes. The very thing that you're thinking about most likely is the, what the Holy Spirit brought up to you. And you didn't want to hear that. Give up this relationship. Give up this, this addiction. Give up this whatever. And that you don't want to give. That's the Holy Spirit trying to tell you what you need to give up. Now, he's there to help you. He's the helper. That's what the Holy Spirit means, one of the meanings. He is the helper. He can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So, Lord, tonight, we lay this foundation so that we can enter into the ministry of reconciliation that, Lord, we realize now this is a hindrance to us walking in what it meant to be in the garden before the fall. And, Lord, we have, in sense, been rebels and refusing to deny our flesh and, Lord, thinking that it will be more painful to not have this than to have it. And it's more painful to have it than to not have it. And, Lord, let us reverse the curse. Let us untwist the wickedness that has been twisted in our minds. Lord, forgive us for allowing our psyche to thrive. And Lord, the disloyalty we have to you because we choose our flesh over the spirit. Father, I repent <laughs> and I ask for true repentance to come in my heart, but I ask for all of us to grow in this truth so that, Lord, we can have what you died for. Lord, you didn't die for us just to have a good little life and be good Christians. You died for us to have life and have it abundantly. You died that we could walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. You, you died that we could have every experience that's in our Bible. You died, Lord, that we can have encounters, a face-to-face -face encounter like Moses did. Lord, that we can have all that is available. Lord, I rebuke the lie and the deception of the enemy who has, who has twisted the truth and has says that life is horrible when we choose this way and that we will have no fun and that we'll have no joy in our life. But, Lord, you are joy and you are life. And, Lord, every other thing is a counterfeit. And so I pray right now as we go, now, here's what I'm going to ask God to do. Give you dreams, visions, revelations, the Word of God, whatever He wants, his impressions, and let God speak to you and begin to reveal any hidden area of where you have not died in the soul. Now, remember, some of you, it's already hit you, and you're trying to push it off, even as I speak. He's already, the Holy Spirit's already telling you something. You know it. You've been fighting it. The Lord is asking you once again kindly to surrender it. All right? There's two ways to remove things. If you can fall on the rock or the rock can fall on you. And it's best to go ahead and fall on the rock. Hear my Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask for prophetic encounters, dreams, visions, encounters. I pray, Father, Scripture to come alive, impressions, 
things that we need to know where our psyche is living and thriving outside of our relationship with you. I pray for Holy Ghost alignment, spirit, soul, and body. We see it, Lord, where our soul has exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And, Lord, we pull down those strongholds now, and we bring every thought into captivity to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that knowledge is what's going to set me free. For when the truth comes, the truth will set me free. And we want a house that's free. We want a freedom in this place so that, Father, men will not control us. Uh, Family will not control us, but we will choose you first in all things. Lord, you do all things well, and you will do this well in our life. So tonight, let our bedrooms become throne rooms. Lord, let our our places of, of, of habitation with you be a place of transformation. That, Lord, we're just letting you look inside of us and find any darkness in us and that we could remove it from us. I pray for a Holy Ghost PET scan where you just like you go over a whole body and just say, well, you got some stuff there, you got some stuff there. And, and I'm willing to, and that's the best part about the Lord. The Lord loves you. And he's not mad at you. This is lower nature. This is normal. It's just a matter of surrender. So, Lord, we surrender our souls to you tonight. And we say, help us, Lord. Look, when you truly understand the message of grace, you'll not want to sin. When you truly understand what Christ died for, you'll not want to sin. When you don't understand the fullness of grace, what will end up happening is you'll think you can just keep getting away with it over and over again. Grace is the thing we have the fear of God with it, where we understand we can't keep this in our life forever. Amen? All right, y'all, y'all still love me? All right? This is the Word of God, so you can get mad at God. You can talk to Him later about this. All right, look at your neighbor and say, I can see your psyches getting delivered tonight. All right? Thank you.